In baseball, a perfect game for a pitcher is 27 batters up, 27 batters down. No hits, no walks, and no errors. In bowling, a perfect game is rolling 12 strikes over 10 frames, not one pin being left in each of those rolls for a total score of 300. A perfect game in the game of spades, you might know, is when you take all 13 tricks as a player or as a team. It's called breaking spades. And if you do that, it's typically seen as an automatic win for the one or the team that does that. Did you know that only 7 out of 10,000 students that take the SAT score a perfect 1,600 on that? 800 for comprehension, 800 for mathematics. And so far as we know, at least in modern times, the youngest person to have successfully done this was a 12-year-old girl in 1999. I don't know about you, but there is something amazing about individuals who are able to hone a craft or to perfect a skill such that they can do it in a flawlessly perfect way. But there's no way that a pitcher is going to throw a, a perfect game or even a no-hitter every time out. No way a bowler is going to consistently, every time without fail, bowl a 300 game. You won't expect somebody to break spades every time. Just the law of averages is against that. And nobody is going to be completely flawless on every test that they take. And if they could do one of those things, they could not do the others at that level. You know, Jesus Christ was the most phenomenal being that ever walked this earth. And so far as the scriptures reveal to us, some of that being because of what was invented and what was not, Jesus never pitched a game. He never bowled a ball. He never played a game of spades, and he never took the SAT. But his goals were infinitely loftier than that. You may remember in John chapter 6 and verse 38, Jesus says to the people on that occasion, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him that sent me. It may surprise you that Jesus says this I have come phrase, this purpose statement of this sort, six times in the Gospel of John. It's found 13 times in the New Testament. But praise God that he came down from heaven. In Colossians chapter 1, we see that he came down to be our king. Colossians 1 in verse 13. He came down to be our redeemer. Colossians chapter 1 in verse 14. He came down to be the image of God or to demonstrate to us the image of God. Colossians 1 and verse 15. He came down to show us the supreme. Colossians 1 and verse 15. He came down to show us the face of the creator and the sustainer. Colossians 1, 16 and 17. And he came down to show us the one to whom belongs first place, the preeminence. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. And if we were to examine each of these individually, we would find out how exhaustive and how perfect each of those qualities are. But they come together to paint the picture of the Jesus that Paul is trying to tell us about in the book of Colossians. I would suggest to you that what is said in each of these qualities implies what the Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter 1 in verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. If you have your Bibles open to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 19, it's more than likely that your translation has the word Father. It's possible that you may have a translation that says God. But what might interest you is that no matter which one it is, that that name for deity is not found in the Greek text in Colossians 1 and verse 19. And there's a reason why translators correctly put the name Father there. It's because of something that the Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. For it pleased them that all the fullness of deity should dwell bodily. The Apostle Paul in Colossians 2 and verse 9 speaks of the fact that this fullness, that it was pleasure of God to see that was existent in Jesus, was because of God's plan or his involvement in that. In fact, I would suggest to you that you have bookends. In Colossians 1, 19, in Colossians 2 and verse 9, that if you are to read these two verses side by side, they are almost identical. 
except for the fact that Paul adds two significant words in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. It's the word deity and the word bodily. Now that's significant because when you take those two words together, it combines to give us one of the most infinite concepts that there could be, and that is the incarnation of God. The fact that Jesus is deity bodily carries with it the idea that God came in the flesh. That Jesus is unique among all creation such that he is God in every degree. And he is human to the full extent. And he is this both at once. Now this word fullness indicates to us that what God is, Jesus is exactly. The idea of fullness that is found here in Colossians chapter 1 is totality and completeness. And so there is nothing that you can see in God, the Godhead, that is not to be seen exactly in Jesus. Now that's a statement that the Apostle Paul makes in Colossians chapter 1 in verse 19. And he is encapsulating in a very short phrase what some of the great texts of the New Testament say about Jesus to help us to understand who it is that we are thinking about when we gather our minds around the Lord's Supper, when we talk about and when we sing about Jesus, when we teach about Him, as we understand who He is, He is the fullness of God. You think about some of the texts that kind of reflect on Colossians 1.19. How about John chapter 1, verse 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And without Him there was not anything made that was made. In fact, John is going to make a statement later in that first chapter of his gospel that mirrors what Paul says in Colossians 2 and verse 9 when he says, And the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. And we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so John amplifies what Paul says in Colossians 1 in verse 19. But it's also something that Paul says to the church at Philippi. He's making a different point there, but when he speaks of Jesus and the mindset of Jesus in Philippians 2 and verse 5, he says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, thought it not a thing to be grasped to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took on him the form of a servant and was found in the likeness of men. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 and through verse 7. Or think about the prologue of the sermon of the Hebrews writer in Hebrews chapter 1 that says that God who in various ways and at various times spoke unto the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken unto us through his Son whom he has appointed heir of all things and by whom he also made the world. He is the, an, a, a, an exhibition of his glory and the exact representation of his nature upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. All of these statements are simply saying what Paul says in, Phil in Colossians 1, 19 and again in Colossians 2 and verse 9. It's a difficult concept for us to grasp and understand the reality of but the New Testament leads us in no other direction but that Jesus is the fullness of God. I'm not sure that I have said anything that's revolutionary or new to you. But as we stay in the text, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 19, it seems to me that the Apostle Paul is drawing some implications. In other words, since that's true, since Jesus can be rightly described in that way, Exactly what God is, Jesus is exactly, what does that mean for us? What can we carry away from that that will have a direct impact in our lives? And I believe Paul, in the very flow of this context, is going to give us at least four answers. Let's notice it together. Since Jesus is the fullness of God, what does that mean for you and me? First of all, because Jesus is the fullness of God, Paul would indicate to us that reconciliation is possible. Reconciliation is to make friendliness where hostility once exists. 
And Paul would say, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him I say, whether they be things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by evil deeds, yet now is he reconciled by the body of his son, of his flesh, through his son that he might present you holy and blameless and beyond reproach in his sight. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which has been preached to every creature under heaven, whereof I, Paul, have been made a minister. There in Colossians chapter 1, verse 19 through 23, the apostle Paul is going to use a word twice. It's the word reconcile. Now, there is a specific word that Paul is using. Some have made the guess that maybe Paul made up this word. It's a more intensified form of the word for reconcile that you'll find in other places in your Bible. This particular word, reconcile, only found three times. Depending on the version you have, Colossians 1.20 and Colossians 1.21, or maybe in Colossians 1.22, and the other one is in Ephesians chapter 3, or 2 rather, in verse 16. When we look at this word, again, it's the idea that the hostility is made friendly. That God stands against all the powers and the forces and he brings about salvation through the blood of the cross of his son. Spiros Zodiatus looks at these two words, the word that we're talking about here and the other word for reconcile, and he says, the stronger form of the word is being used here for reconcile. That the word as it's ordinarily used speaks of bringing about a peace that had not existed before. In other words, creating peace where there had not been peace at all. But the word that's being used right here is a word that indicates to us a restoration of peace, a peace that had been disrupted, that one once had that peace, and yet something or someone came along and made that go away, that is, through the decisions that we made, and as the result of what Jesus did at the cross, there's a way for us to be made at peace with God again. This powerful concept leads us to the very subject that we're looking at tonight. Who or what could make that possible? Only the one who is described in this unique way as Jesus, who is the fullness of God, all man, all God, All at once, Paul is going to go on to say that there are other things that people may tell you that might bring you into a peaceful relationship with your Creator. That it may be vain philosophies and the thinking of men in their deceit as they delude themselves, Philippians chapter 2 in verse 8. And he says it could be that what it might be is that that this uh, pious self-denial or the worship of angels, or puffing up, seeing visions through your fleshly mind, Colossians 2 and verse 18. But the apostle Paul says that none of this is going to avail. But that reconciliation that we can be, God will make those who are his enemies, his friends. But as we look at this reconciliation that's possible because Jesus is the fullness of God, look at that just a little bit more closely, the verses that we have looked at. First thing we see is the harmony of reconciliation. What Paul says is is that God brings us back into a state of restoration with him because of what Jesus did at the cross. What is severed and what's destroyed in our relationship with God through our sin, God makes right through the sacrifice of Jesus and only his sacrifice will do. And so there's a peace, there's a bringing back together that's made possible through reconciliation because Jesus is the fullness of God. But then there we see the hurdles of reconciliation. If you want to look at what's seen in verse 21, it's said in different ways. There's the who and the what and the how of these hurdles. The who of the hurdles is very simply you. You are a hurdle to reconciliation. I want you to follow what Paul says in Colossians chapter 1 in our context. He uses the you, the second person plural you. What we would say is y'all or you all. Everybody together. And so as he speaks about them, he says you in the past were enemies and alienated in your mind by wicked works. 
Yet now, verse 22, you have been reconciled. And then third, from now on, you must continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Now, when I read that, even though I'm not a member of the church at Colossae, I'm going to include myself in that. Because what's true of all those folks there is true of me. I was where they were in my past. And if I've obeyed the gospel... I've had that taken care of, and I must continue to look forward and see. But I'm the hurdle to reconciliation. It won't ever be on God's side. It's on mine. That's the who. The what is enemies or hostile in mind. It's the idea that when I am not reconciled to God, I am public enemy number one. I find it interesting that that concept of public enemy is a very ancient one. It goes back to Roman times. In fact, the Roman Senate uh, Senate was the first to use that, and they used that on the Emperor Nero. And they called him hostis publicus, public enemy, in 68 AD. And it's been used for different people throughout time, even the mobster Al Capone in relatively modern times. We're on God's most wanted list. You know, that's a wonderful thing on one side because that means that God wants us so much that he gave what we're seeing in this context would bring us back to him. But it's also the idea that if we we refuse the reconciliation, it's a warning to us. But then we see the how. How is it because of us that there's a hurdle? And he calls it wicked deeds. It's one of the many words the Bible uses for sin And so in this, we are presented with the fact that there are hurdles in this relationship. And if I refuse to embrace the fullness of Jesus and who he is, then these beautiful blessings we're going to see in the context have no meaning for me. Then we see the holiness of reconciliation in verse 22. And I want you to notice that here there is a human side and a divine side to holiness. Reconciliation, being brought back into a peaceful relationship with God means that God's got to do something that we can't do and that we've got to do something that God won't make us do. Now, on the divine side, God makes us holy and blameless and beyond reproach. There is nothing that we can do to create that effect. That happened by Jesus dying in our place on the cross. And so we have on the divine side that we are made holy through what Jesus did by shedding his blood and the peace that's made on the cross. But I want you to notice that there's a human side. We have to flip a little later on in the letter to see what, how one enters into that reconciliation. Remember in Colossians 2 verse 12, we're buried with him by baptism into death and raised by faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. We were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcisions of our flesh, yet now he has made us alive, having forgiven us of all transgressions, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, Colossians 2, 12 through 14. So when we did that, when we believed, when we were baptized, and when we were raised, but based on our change, of mind, we were brought into reconciliation. But Paul says, you've got to continue. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, we are kept holy by our continuing to walk in a right relationship with him. But then he shows us the hope of reconciliation. Why did God send Jesus, the fullness of God, to this earth to be a sacrifice in our place? It's because God wants that separation and the possibility of separation to be permanently past tense. He wants the falling away possibility and the power of temptation to be forever removed from us. But for that, we look ahead. It's not in this life, but as we hold on to that hope, he says, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, stay on that course. We live with that hope. The hope that we go from being an enemy to being in his family, in his favor. There's a fellow by the name of Rainier Hess. And depending on what kind of military history person you are, Hess may mean something to you. Rainier Hess is the grandson of the infamous commandant of Auschwitz prison, Rudolf Hess. Hess. 
who at his helm was responsible for 1.1 million Jews' death. Rainier Hess heard about the 70th commemoration of the liberation of Auschwitz concentration camp, and he wanted to go. And he wanted to go for a particular reason. He, had devo- he did not know who his grandfather was all of his growing up life. It was only when he became an adult and he read his grandfather's autobiography that he found out just who Rudolf Hess was. And from that point forward, he devoted his life to fighting anti-Semitism wherever he found it. But at the 70th commemoration, he knew that there was going to be a woman there by the name of Eva Kor. Eva Kor was a survivor of Auschwitz. But in the midst of her and her sister, one of a thousand twins, upon whom Hess and his henchmen performed awful experiments, she survived it. She lost her mom and dad and two of her sisters, her grandparents and several aunts and uncles at the hands of Rudolf Hess. Rainier wanted to meet her. They met... He had heard that she had long been speaking publicly about the need for forgiveness and reconciliation. And so he comes up to her. And as a result of this appearance together, they decided that they wanted to go together. And they wanted to decry the evils of the past however they could. But not only did they become friends, eventually Rainier Hess asked Eva Kaur, Can I be your adoptive grandson? She happily agreed. Let me ask you a question. Who has the greater legitimacy of offering reconciliation than one who does so by reaching out to the grandson of a Nazi monster whose horror she survived? Let me ask you this. Who has a greater power to reconcile us to God than God in the flesh who gave himself for us in our place in order to redeem us? 2 Corinthians 5.21 and Hebrews 2 and verse 9. And so because Jesus is the fullness of God, reconciliation is possible. Then second, because Jesus is the fullness of God, the church is important. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24, the Apostle Paul says that he was going to fill up what was lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. I find it interesting, we started at Colossians 1.19. If you go back one verse before that, the Apostle Paul says that Jesus Christ is the head of his body, the church. And so why was the church so important to Paul? Because it's the body of Christ. But more than that, he saw, that is, that Paul saw the church was so important that he was willing to suffer for the church because it's the body of Christ and it belongs to Jesus. And he was willing to take on the ministry, uh, a stewardship of sharing the gospel about the church because the church is that important. The Apostle Paul is saying that the, the, that the church is built upon a foundation of the fullness of God. I want to take you back to Jesus' ministry on earth in Caesarea Philippi and how it was that Peter recognized that Jesus is the fullness of God when Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responds to that by saying that it's because this is true that he is going to build the church on that foundation. The church could be built upon nothing less than Jesus, the fullness of God. The fact that he is in that fullness, all deity and all humanity. And because Jesus had a human body, he could give up that body. And by shedding that blood on the cross, he could purchase the church with that body. Acts 20 and verse 28. But because Jesus is the son of the living God, he is divine. It is a foundation that can never be destroyed. So that Daniel would say in Daniel 2.44, it shall stand forever. Hebrews 12 and verse 28, it cannot be shaken But I want you to think about the implications of that for you and me. Because Jesus is the fullness of God, the church is important. What does that mean? Well, that means that since Jesus is the head, I must submit to him. I understand that the church exists for his purpose and for his pleasure. The church doesn't exist to meet my needs or to please me or to do what I want. The church has one rule maker and it's not me, it's him. And so since Jesus is the head, I must submit to him. And then 
Paul would indicate to us that because Jesus is the head, I must suffer for him and for the church where necessary. The Apostle Paul says, I look and I see that there are areas where the church is deficient and where it's struggling, and so I am going to fill up what's lacking in the afflictions of Christ for your sake. And so I look and see the price that was paid at Calvary and who it was that paid it, Jesus, the fullness of God. And I'm going to say, is there a sacrifice that I'm called upon to make that I will not make? What will I be able to measure and demonstrate that shows my willingness to suffer for the church that's built on this foundation? In my time, in my money, in my faithful attendance, and in my emotional involvement. And because Jesus is the head of the church, I must serve him and the church wherever I can. If I get a hold of the fact, the idea that the church is built upon the foundation of one who is all God and all man all at once, then you're not going to be able to keep me from volunteering and being involved however I can when there's a need that's expressed, whether it's for a Bible class teacher or to go door knocking or if it's to do a follow-up Bible study or anything else. Because I see and appreciate what the church is, I'm going to be a servant as Paul said that he was. A few years ago, there was a woman named Janet uh, Thompson who asked the question in an article, why is the church going dark? And what she was writing about in that article was that there's a trend in religion, and I believe it still continues to some degree, to low the, lower the lighting in the auditorium and to take the windows out so that it has kind of a concert venue or a theater kind of atmosphere. And we understand that the lighting and the windows do not matter. But God doesn't want dark churches. He says we're the light of the world, and he wants us to shine that light wherever we are, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, and dark churches don't please God. Dark churches are invisible to their community. Dark churches are indistinct from the world. Dark churches have no vision and plan for carrying out God's great commission. Dark churches are focused inwardly and not outwardly and upwardly. Dark churches exist to attend and not much more than that. And God never wants us to settle for that. And one reason is because Jesus is the fullness of God. Paul saw that because the church, uh, Jesus rather, is the fullness of God, the church is important. That's an implication in our lives as we see that. But then third, since Jesus is the fullness of God, the gospel is powerful. I want you to notice that the Apostle Paul in this particular section talks about the fact that he has been given a ministry, a stewardship of God's word. And he calls it that at the end of verse 25. And he says as the result of this, he is going to share the mystery that has been uh, uh, hidden in ages and generations past but is now made known and through that, he is going to show the glorious riches of Christ. It seems in this very short little section here that the Apostle Paul is telling us some important things about the gospel. That first of all, the gospel is a gift from God. As the Apostle Paul saw it in verse 25, he says, I have been given a stewardship, and that's the ministry of the gospel. A stewardship is something given, entrusted to be managed. And while there are some borders around this, what God is saying to Paul is, is to the extent that he had that freedom to do so, he says that the gospel is yours to share where you want and when you want and how you want and to whom that you want. He couldn't change that message, Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 9, but the person that Paul was and the personality that Paul had, God was giving him that latitude. And I want you to think about how diverse we are as a congregation. I want you to think about how each of us has been given a stewardship. The gospel has been given to us to share with others, and you may be sharing it from a completely different outlook, different temperament, different personality, different skill set than others. But you use what God has put into your hand and you take that ministry and you do so fueled by knowledge who the Jesus is that you are sharing. But then the gospel is the word of God, verse 25, showing us the source of that gospel. And then the gospel is a mystery that's once hidden. 
Verse 26 and 27. This is something Paul likes to talk about, that there was a message that was hidden that God chose to release in the fullness of time. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, that it contains the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, that it gives patient endurance with joy. Colossians 2, 2 and 3 indicates to us that we have a mystery that's made known that he speaks of in Ephesians 3, 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise of the gospel in Christ Jesus. And then he tells us that this gospel is God's glorious riches, verse 27. But if Jesus is not the fullness of God, the gospel has zero power to do anything. Now the Apostle Paul, at the beginning of this letter, he writes and he tells them what he's praying for the church at Colossae. And he says, I pray that you walk worthy unto the Lord, unto all pleasing. Now what will often happen in the New Testament is we'll have a command, an imperative, and it's followed by participles. And those participles tell us how that, that command is to be obeyed. And Paul walks through in verse 10 and verse 11 and verse 12 and he says some of the various things that are, that are carried out. We walk worthy of the Lord bearing fruit in every good work. Verse 10, we demonstrate by our actions that we're walking worthy of the Lord in that way, but we also increase in the knowledge of God. Verse 10, that is, ironically, you've got to have knowledge to build that knowledge. And then third, he says, strengthen with his might or his power. The gospel is strengthening. Uh, we walk worthy of the Lord and we are strengthened by His power. God does that in His blessings in our life in answer to our prayers through providence, through the indwelling of His Spirit. But He does so through the perfect Word that helps us and strengthens and guides us. And then giving thanks to the Father is how we walk worthy of the gospel. When we see what's been entrusted with us and we see the foundation of it, it helps us to appreciate Jesus as the fullness of God. And because he is, the gospel has the power to save. But then I want you to notice that because Jesus is fully God, his business is urgent. Paul says that he dedicates himself to warning every man and teaching every man that he may present every man complete in Christ. And he says, for this cause I labor, striving with a mighty working that is working in me. Colossians 1, 28 and 29. Will you notice with me that his, his message, that there's an urgent message in this, and the message is Christ. That's what the entire epistle is all about. And by the way, I would say that the entire epistle is about establishing that Jesus is the fullness of God, that he bears the identity that Paul argues for in a world that doesn't believe in that. And so what Paul says here is what Paul says to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 through verse 7, that we don't preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. That the God who called light out of darkness is the one who shone through the power of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That the excellency of the power may be of him and not of us. And we have this treasure in jars of clay that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of you and me. When we understand that the message that we preach is built upon the identity of Jesus, we see how urgent that is. We're not preaching a philosopher, a teacher, a good person. We're teaching more. But then there's an urgent method. The Apostle Paul would indicate to us that we warn every man and we teach every man. Two completely different strategies. Warning is to confront people so as to change an attitude or action. Teaching is instruction in the word and the will of God in its totality that we might help a Christian to grow. What Paul is saying is God's given us an arsenal and we need to use everything in our power that we can that he's given us to persuade people. But then there's also an urgent purpose. And that purpose is revealed as presenting every man perfect or complete in Christ. Jesus' business is universal. It's for every man. Jesus' business is eternal. It is to present everyone perfect in Christ, to get people across the finish line reconciled to God. And his business is manual. He says, I labor, I strive for the good of the gospel.
And so when I come to understand the purpose that he's given to me, and I tie that to the message that I share in my daily life, it's that Jesus is the fullness of God. God's answer to the problem that we share, that not only we share, but the people outside these walls share, that needs to be resolved, and it can only be resolved in this way. You know, I don't know where your favorite destination is. Some like to go to South Alabama. Some like to go to Florida and various places there. But there was one particular family that loved to go to the beach in Panama City Beach, Florida. And on one occasion, it started with two little boys that got caught up in a riptide. And pretty soon, Mom and some of the other family members were trying to save them from 15 feet of swirling water. And then all nine of them were caught in the riptide and were in danger of drowning. And there was a woman who saw them languishing in the water. Her name was Janetta Williams. And Janetta and her family decided that they were going to form a human chain. And so they got them about a football field length. And they linked arm in arm. And they went all the way out to where that family was about to drown. And through that means, they were able to bring them back to shore. And they were interviewing the mother. And she said, we would not be here if it wasn't for them. There are people in need of rescue. And since Jesus is the fullness of God, he's given us a purpose. You know, Paul says in Colossians 1.23 that the first century church had a purpose and that was to share the gospel and they had taken the gospel to every creature under heaven. But that mission has not been rescinded. And the message has never been more relevant than it is today. Since Jesus is the fullness of God, his business is urgent. I grew up collecting baseball and football and basketball cards. I think baseball cards were my favorite, and I started collecting them when uh, I was uh, in grade school, uh, back in the golden age of the, the hobby, I guess, in the 1970s. When I played JV football, I had a collection in my locker, and I know the boy that did it, but somebody stole it. He never, he never owned that up to that. I'm not still bitter about it, but I, I remember it happening. But I, I remember when I started collecting baseball cards, especially about 1980, the only game in town in baseball cards was Tops, that company. Now, in 1981, as I began to get more serious, there was Fleer and Donruss, and, and there had been others in the past, but Tops was really the gold standard. They were really the ones at the head of the industry, a unique one of a kind. Something happened all the way through the years, and finally I just lost interest because all these different companies got involved, and they did uh, gloss, and they did foil, and 3D, and all kind of other things. It was just overwhelming. That may be a poor way to illustrate this, but there was in Colossae all these competing philosophies and ideas, and people were coming along, and they were saying there's this new and improved brand of Christianity that was better than what the Apostle Paul and the other apostles were teaching. And they were also saying that there was a new and improved Jesus. And so Paul in Colossians is pushing back against both of these ideas. He is saying that there, it is the uniqueness of Jesus that can't be replicated and duplicated anywhere else. The uniqueness that he is deity and he is humanity in one that makes him the authentic. There are so many counterfeits and there are so many Johnny-come-latelys that cannot compete. You know, that may fall under the umbrella of world religions that teach some other way. Or the umbrella of Christendom that teaches Christ in some other way. Or even atheism that says there's no need for a way. But I think about what Paul says in Ephesians 4 and verse 5. He says, there is one Lord. When we contemplate who that Lord is, who Paul goes to such lengths to share with us, that it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, that the fullness of God dwelt in bodily form in Jesus. What does that mean to you and me? It means that only because this is true is reconciliation possible. Only because of that, that we can respond to that gift at Calvary through faith and repentance and baptism as Paul presents to the Colossians. But it also means that the church is important. It means that you as a member of the church are important to us and you're important to God. And you have an important part to play to fill up what may be lacking in the body of Christ. That the gospel is powerful. That it has the heart and message, that Romans 1.16 message because of who Jesus is 
and it means that his business is urgent. And he doesn't need us stepping away from it for anything. He needs us to stay faithful to it. And he wants us, if we stop, to be able to come back to him and be reconciled once more, to have that peace once again. It may be that this is an invitation to which you need to respond and that we can encourage you and help you. If so, we would urge you to come right now as we stand and sing.